Hey YouTube. It seems like television programs cover a lot of ground these days. They can make us laugh, cry, or even subscribe to dangerous conspiracy theories. But, above all, good television shows make us feel human. And that makes them a lot like horror movies. Now, you might be thinking, How To With John Wilson doesn't really look like a horror movie. And you'd, uh, you'd be right. It's missing the low-key light, the looming monster, and the dissonant soundtrack. But that's okay. Because above all, horror is a genre located in the body. In its ability to make us feel fear. A good horror movie leverages its incredible power over our bodies to make us feel more alive. When we become afraid, suddenly our sense of our own physicality and temporality become... constricted. Our bodies feel small, and we are acutely aware of the sensation of living in them. And our perception of the past and sense of the future shrink too so that we can only feel the present moment, because all our attention is in sharp focus on the perceived danger before us. But with a safe distance between our lived reality and the events on screen, we often find these heightened sensations to be pleasurable. I think How To With John Wilson works that way too. So stick with me, and you'll know all about making your viewers complicit in your social anxiety. And if you do it right, they might actually like it. First, you'll need a plucky narrator who will try to learn how to master a seemingly simple task each week. We'll call him John. But people have pretty short attention spans these days, so you'll want to provide some moving pictures to uh, keep them occupied. This can be either a selection of street footage that correlates in some way to the topic, or a first-person point of view as your narrator moves throughout the world. This first type of shot should usually be something lighthearted or amusing, like a woman stuffing a pigeon into a shopping bag, just as a random example. But sometimes the images can turn dark, Distortions of the body, or scenes that imply that some sort of violence has transpired. While watching the show, the parade of shifting images can often become dissociated from its documentary reality. Through John's narrative commentary, which often repositions the images as sight gags, the scenes may begin to feel intentional, or even fictional. But, in moments of implied violence, we may become startled and briefly snap back into consciousness. It becomes uncomfortably apparent that the images we see record real events. We may involuntarily begin to imagine what could have preceded these scenes. And, unlike in a horror movie where we can take comfort in knowing that no harm really came to the actors, or will come to us, these phantoms of violence, real violence, force us to confront the candid reality of each image presented on the show. The same thing may happen when someone on screen turns and acknowledges the camera, when they see us seeing them. In these moments, when we remember that we are watching real situations and real people who did not always know that they were being recorded or even observed, one of our worst social anxieties can become a real threat. People might see us behave embarrassingly in public. We may wonder if we will see ourselves or someone we know being uncouth on screen, and even if we figure out later that actually a lot of the people signed a release form, we still must confront the reality that at any moment, we might be known by others, and we are powerless to control how they perceive us. And this stress will become the background for the rest of our perceptions about the show. But then you can show a guy with a dog on his head to relieve some of the tension. 
Luckily, even if your audience doesn't have that much anxiety about being seen in public, uh, you'll have something in store for them, too. The majority of the show should assume a first-person point of view. This has the effect of making us feel extremely empathetic to the camera. Our consciousness is displaced onto the lens, as though it is our own eyes. And because we know, or at least assume, that John is behind the camera, uh, his voice becomes ours. And he'll use that voice to constantly remind us about his own loneliness. But don't mention that it's a painful reminder of your ex uh, who gave it to you uh, because she loved you, even though you were emotionally unavailable uh, to her. So uh, that becomes ours as well. As John seemingly struggles to make connections with people, we might start to realize that his neurotic obsessions with simple tasks are centered around his fears. He wants to learn how to make small talk and how to split the check because he's afraid of alienating people. He wants to learn how to cover his furniture and how to improve his memory because he's afraid of losing his memories and the objects that are associated with them. And he wants to learn how to make the perfect risotto because he's afraid of losing someone that he cares about. So it makes sense that John also wants to learn how to put up scaffolding to protect himself from bodily and emotional harm. And because we identify so strongly with the first person point of view, we may start to mirror these anxieties. But seemingly by coincidence, and without any prompting at all, people will start to open up to him about their own divorces and failed relationships. 86? Yeah. Yeah, I got married in that year. Don't want to remember that too much. She had very, very good taste, my ex-wife. Not gonna lie, I'm a bachelor. Me too. Usually, people want to talk, but sometimes they'll put up walls. They may even try to avoid John. And then he might do something really scary, like becoming vulnerable. Throughout these conversations, it's important to leave some time to breathe in the long silences. Uh, you might think this will make the audience squirm and cringe, the same way that they cover their eyes and turn away when a horror movie becomes too much. And uh, it will. But that's okay. We want to teeter on the border of being amused by the awkwardness and overwhelmed by it. Because no matter how close it feels, there's always a safe distance between our bodies and what's happening on the screen. And that's doubled by the distance that John puts between himself and his subjects using the camera. But maybe we don't want that distance to be there. Even without the strict stay-at-home orders of a pandemic, it can be hard for us to feel in touch with our bodies. Often, it can feel like life is flat, because there's so much happening in the world that our consciousness has to act as a barrier to protect us from overstimulation. We can't let any experience get too close, because that can hurt, and our puny brains can't always handle it. But when we watch TV and movies, sometimes it feels like we're bypassing our consciousness and getting a direct line into our subconscious. Right now, when it's even harder to connect with people from six feet away and behind a mask, I think it's easy to understand why we'd be willing to submit our subconscious to this carnival of anxiety. Because part of making connections with people is feeling weird and awkward and being embarrassing in public. And John Wilson isn't afraid to do that. Or maybe he is, but he does it anyway, and it seems like it turns out okay. So maybe we'll be okay too, when we can all go outside again. In the meantime, I'll be watching television. 
Thanks so much for watching. Uh, this video was a little different for me, but if you liked it, you can check out some of my other video essays and maybe even subscribe if you're into that kind of thing. Okay, bye.